In half an hour, Doctor Who and the Daleks, first on BBC One at the end of 3D TV week, Tomorrow's World shows us how it's done. TV yet, and what did you think? A major step forward in television history or a seaside novelty? Well, tonight is your last chance to decide because in a moment, Bob Symes will be entering the third dimension. Very scary. And then we'll reveal how it's done. What else? Ah, Hubble. The space telescope is due for its 600 million mile service. This is the big one for NASA. After recent cock-ups, they really need to get this one right. What else? Ah, oh, yes, fish. Something strange is happening with salmon. They're being bred to tell you where they're born. Let's get straight on with it. Put on your glasses, take a couple of aspirin. It's 3D time. Kate. Well, we've reported on many 3D techniques in the past, and so naturally, we're going to have a go at this one, especially as five million of you have already got the glasses. By the way, banks and building societies are still accepting donations for children in need. In a few minutes, we'll demonstrate the secret of how it works. First, here's Bob Symes. And if you don't have the glasses, don't worry, because with this system, you still get a perfectly good 2D picture. When cycling, you always have to be in the right gear. And I don't mean the clobber I'm wearing. But bicycles are sprouting new gears every year. And this one is automatic. It relies on the centrifugal effect to shift the gears. As the wheel spins faster, three weights fly out, pushing the plate, which forces the derailleur to change into a higher gear. To make sure it works shifting down the gears, the freewheel is not on the rear gear block, but on the pedals, which means that the chain is always in motion. So, spring action on the weights automatically shifts the derailleur back down into low gear as I slow down. Marvelously ingenious. Mind you, the bike's got a mind of its own. The expert cyclist won't really like it, but for me, a weekend cyclist, it's great. Our bodies naturally have two gears, running and walking, and the distinction is taken very seriously by Britain's race walkers. Technically, to be walking and not running, one foot must always be in contact with the ground. Judging this by eye has always proved unreliable. Now, there's a pair of shoes that could help. Each shoe monitors contact with the ground with sensors in the heel and toe. The two shoes send messages to each other via minute electrical impulses through the body. So, if one toe leaves the ground before the other heel lands, the shoes emit a cautionary bleep. Persistent foul snaps and the red light comes on alerting the judges. These tents contain 10 meters of coiled spring steel. When thrown into the air, the steel tries to become straight erecting the tent on the way down. There's quite a, a knack in stirring these away. A few twists and, with a spot of luck, the spring steel folds in a, on itself. There we are. There you are, nice and neat. Mind you, I would not like to ride out a storm in one of these. <laughs> I feel a bit dizzy after that, but you can have a rest from your glasses for a moment. 
The 3D effect isn't difficult to see, although, to be honest, there are going to be a few people who'll never see it at all. It's not actually a new idea for 3D. It's been used for television before, but never so ambitiously as in this past week. So, how does it work? The 3D we see in normal life relies on our brains processing two separate images from two slightly different viewpoints. Most 3D systems reproduce different views for each eye. And various ways have been invented for getting two moving images to our eyes. The two-colour system is probably the best known. But, as with all these systems, if you're not wearing the glasses, the picture you see is much worse than usual. Useless for broadcasting. But the 3D shown on the Beeb this week looks normal to people not wearing the glasses. That's because the effect doesn't rely on transmitting two separate images, but on a peculiarity of the way we see things. It's called the Pulfric effect. What it is, is that the eye and the brain actually take longer to process a dark image than a brighter one. That's why you've got a dark filter on one side of the glasses. That means that the brain gets information from the right eye a fraction of a second later than the left. Now, that delay can produce a 3D effect when something's moving on your TV. Here's what happens. Say an object, in this case Carmen, moves across the screen from left to right. Now freeze a particular instant. What you see through the left eye with the light filter is Carmen here. But through the right eye with the dark filter, you see Carmen back here, where she was a 50th of a second ago. The brain, always keen to make sense of what signals the eyes are sending it, fuses the two separate images together and places the object where the two lines cross, here, apparently closer to the viewer. With an object moving the other way, it's reversed. Through the left eye, it's here. Through the right eye, here. And now the lines cross further away. So there's nothing special about the technology at our end, a perfectly normal TV camera pointing at this carousel. Try looking at it through the glasses. The things in the foreground are moving right, and the ones in the background moving to the left. Well, it's a treat. Now, let's prove the point. Change the direction of the carousel, and the effect disappears. But now, try turning your glasses the other way around, and you should see it again. Got it? Well, it can happen with all sorts of moving objects. Bits of football match or the 315 at Aintree may end up in 3D. All this explains why the 3D pieces you've seen this week have never stopped moving. The technique requires a bit of careful planning, not to say choreography, but probably the biggest challenge is 3D drama. We followed the BBC team making the new episode of Doctor Who, shown last weekend. <laughs> It brought back some familiar faces, but it also brought together a lot of technicians, designers and camera experts to make it work. When was the last time you had that junk keeping for an MOT professor? Don't, don't be cynical, eh? It's just the instruments are just a little erratic, that's all. Great, well, the the trick of the whole thing was to stage the movement to create the best 3D effect. A real challenge for the director, Stuart MacDonald. It takes perhaps a bit longer than it would simply shooting a, a regular drama. One of those reasons is that the shots, by definition, have got to be on the move most of the time. And if the camera isn't moving, the people certainly have to be. And so you've got to get three or four people to move in particular directions when they're doing their right line and so on. And the scenery plays an important part too. OK, so we can slowly build up the foregrounds. Yeah, OK. For objects in the foreground to stand out, the camera must track past them so they cross the picture from left to right. We are running up to the pause. Oi! Is anybody there? Good. Now, what about the other foreground? I, I think it looks like a classic serial. It's the barrel work. Mm -hmm. we'll, go, we'll go and reduce the barrel work. They place things in front of you, whereas before, normally, that's all clear, so you can be seen. But they give depth of field. All right, so the props are there, sort of prominently in front. So you yes, they're upstaging you. Oh. Get away, prop. <laughs> Maybe actors don't like that. It has to be very much an action adventure rather than a, a close dialogue situation because obviously the minute you get into close-ups, uh, there is no real 3D element unless you move the camera. And by moving the camera, quite often you'll move from one side of the face to the other, which gives you enormous grammar problems in terms of cutting the shots together. What's very important, of course, is that every shot doesn't look the same. If you're not, if you're not careful, you, you, you always have a bit of 
railings in the foreground moving in one direction or you always have a car always moving in that direction and so on. So um, we're aware of the movements but the real trick is how to vary them within the context of, of the drum piece. So is there a future for this kind of technique? I think its application in drama per se is a little limited in that it has to be something that's really specially written for it in order to make it work. I think that a, a 30 minute drama or or even a 25-minute drama, all in 3D, might get a little wearing. So how have you found wearing the glasses? <laughs> well, I've enjoyed them no end. These are the, the executive model, um, the producer's perks, as they're called, which have uh, that capability on them. I must say, I put these on, you look three-dimensional both ways. But that's because you are. <laughs> and that's the point. Competing with the sense of depth we get in real life is no easy job. The idea of 3D TV, though, seems so seductive that people are bound to keep on trying. Women in Britain are at a higher risk of their babies developing spina bifida than in most other countries in the world. But the incidence could be reduced by three quarters if women included a simple vitamin supplement in their diet, starting before they conceive. This is the remarkable conclusion of a study carried out by the Medical Research Council. All the evidence now shows that women who are thinking about having a baby should be taking a daily dose of folic acid, one of the B vitamins. It's cheap, it's got no taste, but women still aren't taking it. Fiona Crusi has one child with spina bifida. Gaina, her little girl, has difficulty walking. She tripped up and cut her face just before we went to see her. Five weeks before she was born, um, we had a scan and um, the scan picked up the fact that she had uh, a slight swelling on the lower back. Her leg is um, slightly twisted and she can't feel the outer part of her foot, but she is able to feel her legs. But obviously in other cases, they're not quite so fortunate. Last year, 250 babies were born with spina bifida and more than 4,000 pregnancies were terminated, most of which could have been prevented with folic acid. New leaflets and posters from the Department of Health with advice about this are now appearing in the doctor's surgeries. But the problem is that by the time most women visit their doctor, it's already too late. The baby is past the critical stage. Folic acid has to be taken while the nervous system is developing. That's from day one through to the 12th week of pregnancy. So, taking a simple vitamin supplement can reduce the risk. But even women who know they should be taking folic acid can be caught out. Fiona Crusi is now expecting another baby. We weren't actually planning to have another baby. This was a total accident. And um, I didn't believe in accidents before I fell pregnant this time. Um, we used to get the calendar out every single time. And then suddenly, that was it. I was seven weeks pregnant. I couldn't believe it. I was quite devastated because I knew I hadn't taken the folic acid tablets that I should have done. Well, actually, most pregnancies are unplanned. So the only way to protect every baby is to put folic acid into everyday food. So far, the government has suggested that manufacturers put it into some breads and cereals. But very few have done so. That's because it's not a law. It's purely voluntary. Now, one of the government's own advisers thinks the law should be changed to put folic acid into flour, like we put fluoride into the water supply. If one wants to regard choice as an absolute, then automatically putting folic acid in is going to mean that some people will be buying uh, bread that will have folic acid without knowing it. The cost of that is that by having explicit choice and, uh, and, and requiring people to say, look, I'd like bread with folic acid, very few people in need will actually get the folic acid in the bread and more babies will be born with spina bifida than would otherwise be the case. I think that more could be done, particularly when the remedy is so simple safe and economical. In America, legislation is being introduced to make sure all breads and cereals which claim they're vitamin enriched have the extra folic acid that women need. Now that we have the scientific evidence to prove that folic acid can prevent spina bifida, why can't politicians here give us the same legislation? I'd show them Gaina for a start and, and show them her leg and uh, tell them how important it is for people to have the right diet before they actually conceive because it can prevent so many deformities in a, in a baby. 
We're so lucky Gaynor can actually feel her legs so she can actually walk. But the next one might not be so lucky. Christmas must be close. The annual Drink Drive campaign kicks off next week and the police will be out in force with their breathalysers. But breath testing isn't just about alcohol. Apparently, there are about 400 other chemicals wafting around in each breath. Some of the more socially undesirable come from what we eat, but it's not just the obvious things that do the harm. Pork, beef, chicken, lamb, pig's blood, veal, venison, or even wild boar. Yes, even something as tame as meat can cause a nasty niff. That extra bit of protein keeps smell-producing bacteria very happy. Oh, it's horrible. No, it's still horrible. Other chemicals that crop up in breath can give a clue to somebody's health. For example, you can spot diabetes by the vague aroma of nail varnish remover. So sniffing out individual chemicals may turn out to be a useful way of diagnosing other diseases. Although bad breath is bad news for humans, animals have a completely different outlook on life. It seems scientists are getting very excited about what comes out of the mouths of cows. Now this is a bad smell. Well, mosquitoes don't think so. In fact, they find it particularly compelling stuff. So the researchers want to see if they can cut down on pesticides by luring the mosquitoes to traps using essence of cow breath. Books are barcoded. Cabbages are barcoded. Bees are barcoded. Yes, even bees. Researchers in America are using barcodes to identify individual bees to learn more about their behavior. And now, well, it was only a matter of time. Two questions immediately spring to mind. Where would you put a barcode on a fish and why would you want to? Well, huge numbers of salmon are reared in hatcheries and biologists need a way of working out where these salmon end up once they've been released into the wild. Well, now they've found an astonishing way of labelling fish using the world's first biological barcode. By manipulating a quirk of nature, they've created a barcode deep within a fish's head without even touching it. Now, most fish have two of these. They're called otoliths, and they're essential to a fish's balance and hearing. Well, on the screen is a slice through the otolith of a Pacific salmon. And a new layer is added to the otolith every day throughout a fish's life. So these rings represent a sort of running record of its life, just like the rings on a tree. And like on a tree, there's less growth in cold weather, which causes darker rings to form in the otolith. And that brings us back to barcodes, because this temperature effect is now being used to label otoliths deliberately. By raising and lowering the temperature of salmon eggs by about 5 degrees Celsius as they grow, a pattern of light bands and dark rings can be formed on the otolith of every fish simultaneously, a pattern that remains for the rest of their lives. And this is the result, well-defined bands of varying widths. And what's more, the codes are reliable enough to be read automatically. So let's see where this fish came from. All right, it's done the analysis, and it says it's barcode three, and that fish came from the Green River Hatchery. Let's have another go on a different fish. You can see that the rings are a different pattern here. So I'll take a cross section of these, and we'll find out whether this comes from a different hatchery. So if we look over at the other screen, this time it says barcode 5, Nooksack Hatchery. Creating more bands produces more barcodes and so far they've got a thousand different ones. In a few years time they reckon hundreds of millions of fish could be carrying their own birth certificates in their heads. Now, over the last few weeks we've been following the story of a family with a potentially fatal inherited disease. The latest surgical techniques can help treat the effects of the disease, but this family is also helping to reduce the risk for others. What I'd like you to do first, Robert, take a big breath in, put your lips around the tube and blow it all the way out nice and steadily. Robert Wackrell has a life-threatening disease which needs treatment. Right to the end. 
right to the end. He suffers going, from going, HHT, an inherited disorder better. which weakens his Lots blood vessels. <coughs> He's already had treatment for a stroke caused by a burst vessel in his brain. And here at London's Hammersmith Hospital, Robert has now learned that he needs an operation to repair a damaged blood vessel in his lungs. He's also just found out that his 10-year-old son, Michael, is the latest member of the family to have inherited the disease. Robert's own father died from HHT five years ago. Because HHT can damage blood vessels throughout the body, Robert is screened to see if other areas are affected. There's absolutely no abnormality seen in any of them. Do we have a look at Yes, this thank, you. thank you. At least the delicate vessels in his eyes are healthy. Oh, yes. They look pristine. But with a day to go before his operation, a blood vessel in Robert's lungs needs more investigation. Some deep wood breaths in and out, OK? Right. That's all you have to do in life's slow Blood is leaking from the damaged vessel, and to investigate, radioactive particles are injected into Robert's bloodstream. Any blood leaking from the lung will show up elsewhere in his body. We're also seeing the outline of the kidneys here, this being the right kidney and not quite as clearly seen the left kidney here. So there is some amount of particles actually bypassing the lung going to the kidneys. It's now 12 hours to go, and radiologist James Jackson, who will carry out the operation, explains what it involves. Most of your lungs, we know already from the test you've had already, are completely normal. OK. Yep. But in one particular place, um, you have a hole between the artery and the vein, and it will look something like this. You'll have a big artery coming down to a ballooned mm -hmm. vein. Usually, the lungs act as a filter, like a coffee filter. Um, so that little bugs or little clots of blood which come up the veins into the lungs, usually they get stopped out in this filter and you have a potential for a bug or a blood clot to actually pass through the hole into this main artery here and obviously the first place it meets is the brain and therefore you run a risk of developing a brain abscess or even a stroke right. which is obviously very, very severe and um, something which, which we want to, to try and avoid. Now, what we plan to do tomorrow is place a metal coil in here, and maybe two, three, maybe up to five coils to completely block that segment of artery. Right. I've actually brought a coil along with me, which, uh, just to show you what these things look like, and we need to choose exactly the right size coil to block off that artery. Right. And that's what we will be leaving actually inside you. As well as treating HHT, the Hammersmith team are getting closer to finding its cause. Professor Michael Hughes is very interested in Robert's 40 relatives. These very large families are extremely important in tracing the abnormal gene. The larger the family, uh, the more closely we can map the site of the gene. It's rather like looking for a single house in the whole of the United Kingdom. We've narrowed it down now to a house in a single street. And with a few months more work, I think we'll have actually found the gene. And so we'll be able to tell parents whether their children are affected or not. But it's the next couple of hours which worry Robert as he faces the intricate operation. He'll remain conscious as a thin tube, a catheter, is threaded into his body. May feel a little bit of, of pressure here. Right. Oh, <laughs> All we do now is just getting it up through the uh, veins, going to the to the lung. Okay. Doctor Jackson has to be extremely precise. Okay, just stop breathing there for me. Very, very still. Now to map out the lung, a dye is injected. Let me just show you what it looks like. We just carry on forward. Do you see there? You can see the blood vessels. Yeah. We can see this big. 
aneurysm of the vein, where the hole is. Not the dark area, is it? Or the dark area, that big dark area yeah. there. And that's the bit we need to block. Next Strands of material on the coil will help the blood to form a clot and so stop the leak. I'm going to put the coil actually into the catheter. Here the coil comes. You can see it coming round the corner there, just to the end of the catheter. And there it is at the tip of the catheter. We now we draw the central, very thin wire, so that now as we push the coil out, it will actually form its coil in the neck of this hole. You can actually see the metal coil uh, sitting in the lung there. This is where we've injected. You notice that before we were seeing that jet of dye yep. coming up here to fill the hole. Uh, to fill that great big blob, but it's completely blocked. What's more, we managed to preserve all those normal branches, which I thought we might have to block. So we've preserved all your normal lung, which is great. I'm pleased. A successful end to Robert Wackrell's series of complex operations. He hopes that research in this hospital will lead to a cure for HHT, so future generations of his family will not have to cope with the ordeal of this inherited disease. Hmm. So what are you doing this weekend? Me? I'll be at home changing the nappies. Slightly less exciting, perhaps, than Catherine Thornton and Story Musgrave, because they'll be spending their weekend wandering about in space, trying to repair the world's most powerful telescope. You know the Hubble Space Telescope. It's the one with the lazy eye that costs $2 billion to build, and it'll cost another half a billion to fix. Because soon after the telescope was launched, three years ago, NASA realized they'd made a serious mistake. The telescope uses a two-meter mirror, accurately curved to focus the starlight. But when the first pictures came through, they revealed that the mirror wasn't curved enough. Now, it wasn't far out, just 1 50th the thickness of a human hair. But that's enough to seriously blur the telescope's vision. The shuttle astronauts will be trying to correct that problem by fitting a compensating mirror, sort of contact lens. But first of all, they have to hook up with the space telescope. This morning, the shuttle manoeuvred alongside the telescope, and later tonight, it'll try to grab it using its robotic arm. Assuming that 12 tons worth of the most delicate instrument ever built can be brought on board without damaging it, the astronauts will then begin a major series of spacewalks. As well as correcting the mirror, they'll also be trying to fix its guidance system and totally replace the solar panels, making it NASA's most complicated mission since they went to the moon. Even the astronauts admit that it'll be a miracle if everything goes to plan. But NASA are gambling on this mission being the spectacular success they desperately need to restore their reputation. And next week, I'll be talking to Mission Control in Houston and giving you a full update on what happens. But that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the weekend. We will, of course, be back next Friday. Till then, good night.